Hey everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Common Issues in Collections Housing, Simple Solutions for Houses and Framed Objects. I'm Ben Elzada, I'm the Housing Technician at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. I'm glad you could join me today. I would like to remind everyone that many of us are using our home internet and devices, so if there's any lag or connection issues, uh, please bear with us. We, you might need to log out and sign back into the webinar session just to refresh the connection. And the DIPS team member will be standing by to provide technical support as best we can. Some background before we begin. The Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York, or DIPSNY, is a five-year collaborative initiative between the New York State Archives Documentary Heritage Program and the New York State Library's Conservation and Preservation Program. Uh, to deliver essential training and services to New York's collecting institutions. Uh, it was established in 2016 by the New York State Education Department's Office of Cultural Education uh, to ensure consistent and comprehensive services to the vast network of organizations that safeguard New York's records and make them accessible. DIPSTE services include archival needs assessments, preservation and conservation surveys, guidance with strategic planning, and access to a variety of educational programs, such as this webinar. And hopefully soon, in-person workshops, which we're hoping to resume in 2021, uh, but it depends on the pandemic situation. Um, Disney is, Dipsney is also making these services available free of charge to New York-based organizations that collect, preserve, uh, uh, pre collect and preserve historical records and materials in order to make them accessible for future generations. Um, so, let us begin. We are going to be looking at some common collection conditions and issues that you might run into in your institution and cover how to assess them, as well as some simple solutions for how you can address them in-house, as well as some professional options that you can take. Uh, first and foremost is identifying common issues in your collection. And there are several common issues that will plague them, of uh, all sizes regardless and they fall into four general categories. Pests, ambient condition issues, object-related issues, and housing-related issues. Uh, uh, these four general categories overlap with the, most of the 10 factors of deterioration, most notably relative humidity and temperature, light, pollutants, pests, and mold. Um, other factors for deterioration that you can see that are not part of this one, they're in the 10, are physical forces and thieves, vandals, and displacers, which are mainly external issues that are not in the same vein of problems as general housing condition. Uh, excessive handling of an object, even when it's stored under excellent conditions, can still lead to damage. Similarly, any person with malicious, malicious intent can damage an object regardless of how well it's being stored. Um, another one on the list is fire, uh, which is always something that can be taken into consideration. However, if some things in your collection were to spontaneously combust or ignite, it's something that hopefully would be quickly noticed um, as they can't really go undetected for long periods of time because things will tend to just catch fire everywhere. Uh, damages from fire are a whole separate category unto themselves and require a much more in-depth discussion than what I'm going to be talking about today. There are several great DIPSNY and CCAHA programs and webinars dedicated towards disaster planning and emergency responses for stuff like fires. And I highly rec recommend everyone checking those out when you can. The last of the 10 factors of deterioration is custodial neglect and disassociation, which occurs when active care is not taken to preserve the collection or when information and practices on the collection are not current with what's being done in the world today. It also comes into play when a collection's object gets disassociated from their records, and hopefully this doesn't happen at your institution, but it's always good practice to take a survey of your collection every so often just to make sure that you have everything accounted for. Um, things to do when you're checking for the issues in your environment. Uh, it's always important to be vigilant about looking for any potential threats and damages. Things you should look for are traces of insects or rodents or pests. You should see if the storage space feels too hot or too cold, if your ambient temperature is incorrect or not. 
uh, you should look for leaks or cracks in the building and the infrastructure around your collection um, or any other places that moisture could get in or signs that things have shifted or moved. And lastly, just look for any visible signs of mold or condensation buildup, like puddles of water and things like that. Uh, all of the issues that I'm going to talk about today are things which means they are issues that will continue to get worse and further damage the artwork if it's not addressed. Luckily, there are many existing Dipsney webinars that you can watch that will address and go into much deeper detail on specific topics. Uh, there will be a list of links to each of them at the end of this presentation that you'll also get at the within a week or so after this webinar. Um, Okay, next. So the first issue I'm going to talk about is pest issues within framed matted objects, how to identify them and some solutions for removing the damaging detritus. Um, as you know, pests are a very dangerous threat to a museum. Um, so if you ever find insects larvae and or insect brass inside of an object's housing, you, they can cause a lot of damage even after they die. Uh, as they decay, they release VOCs or volatile organic compounds that can seriously stain, destroy um, important objects. Um, they also, when they're alive, they'll just eat through something. Um, if you ever find an object with an infestation, you should check the surrounding items, the furniture, air vents, stands, everything, to see if the infestation has spread or if it originated somewhere else. Uh, once you have identified the full extent of its reach, collect and dispose of non-necessary items. I know touching insect-infested objects might feel a little gross, but if you, as long as you wear some PVE and dispose of it in a sealed trash disposal, preferably outside of your building, uh, you should be fine. Um, also, before you remat or reframe an object, uh, you should thoroughly inspect it and make sure there's no leftover insects on it or damage um, that you might have missed on previous cleanings or just when you were trying to throw things out. Uh, if an object is damaged to the point that you have concerns, it's always a good idea to call a conservator for consultation just to see if they are anything that's lasting or that might be something that you, can, you can't see with your naked eye. And then I also included two different kinds of infestations here, some of them that happen in frames and some things that will accumulate on the back of uh, pictures or stuff like that. Um, larvae are very noticeable, especially for larva casings. And then insect brass is something else that you can kind of see a little stain. Um, here are just some common pests you'll find in your collection. Cockroaches are always common all over. Silverfish, uh, museum beetles, carpet beetles, house centipedes, book lice. Um, I strongly recommend everyone looking to the database that's in the link on there when you have a chance uh, just to see what are common insects and pests that you have in your collection or collections that are similar to yours. The next larger topic is going to be at ambient atmospheric issues, so environmental problems. Uh, these are, uh, I strongly recommend that you create an environmental monitoring program just so you can see what's around you and see how your conditions are lining up and how they're going. Um, if you don't already have one, uh, as most of these issues may or may not be something that you might have thought about in the past, um, having an environmental monitoring program will let you kind of see and catch any of these issues that we're talking about in this webinar uh, preemptively, hopefully. So you might have a chance of preventing further damage to your objects. Um, just something to check for environmental temperatures is, is the temperature and humidity of the storage area too high or too low? It's always important to keep your collection stored in space that doesn't have a large fluctuation of temperature or the humidity of changes very often. Um, changes like that can lead to mold growth, rust, distortion, mechanical issues, and a bunch of other things. You should always keep your space at a consistent temperature. Uh, you should monitor your environment as much as you can. We recommend using uh, data loggers, which kind of track the environmental changes of a space over time. And you can also use things like silico gel or sealed packages to kind of stabilize and condition smaller spaces. Um, I cannot stress how important it is to keep your objects at least in a minimally controlled environment because, um, once again, an uncontrolled environment can lead to biological, chemical, and mechanical damages. Um, 
Another thing to be aware of is different types of archival materials do best in different kinds of storage conditions. Uh, so for example, photographic and film materials should generally be stored in cold or frozen storage uh, with an RH of about 30 to 50 percent, while things like parchment objects should be in conditions that kind of are about an RH of 45 to 60 percent. Um, just some basic guidelines just for the general overview of relative temperature, relative humidity and temperature. Um, the ideal RH for most, I can't say all, but for a lot of the objects that you can generally see in your collection uh, is about 50% with a plus or minus 5% degree. But once again, each object is different. Uh, so each object has its own best RH. 50% plus or minus 5% is a rough guideline. Um, the ideal temperature for an object is around 21 degrees Celsius, uh, so about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, plus or minus four degrees um, in Celsius. So like up to about 75 at the most, and like kind of below 65 to 75 is a great range, ideally. Um, pa uh, pa paper objects will reach equilibrium with the RH and temperature of their environment. So that means that there's a lot of moisture in the air, the paper will become saturated. And then if it's, there's no moisture in the air, it'll become brittle, things like that. Um, rapid changes in RH and temperature can cause distortion in artwork. So like the substrate will flake, it'll warp if you've seen that. In humid climates, parchments will get really, really wavy. Um, sometimes you'll see flaking media. Um, and also you might have a case where a hinge or a mount fails due to something of that nature. Um, RH over 65% usually result in microbiological activity, which means mold growth or something of that nature, which is possible. And it's also something you should be watching out for because mold is a very serious issue. Uh, outside of chemical and biological problems, many pests, so insects and rodents, thrive in places with high humidity and high temperatures. Uh, keeping temperature and RH under control will help keep your pest problem under control. Another thing to keep in mind is that places with the highest art relative humidity in the room are usually next to the coldest surfaces in the room, like a window or a vent. Uh, so when you place an object near them, you gotta be careful and be aware that that's what's gonna happen there. You can also place objects into a sealed micro environment, uh, which will protect from the day-to-day -day fluctuations of a ambient condition, while also protecting the object from things like pests and moisture. If condensation and moisture is a problem in your space, um, things like a leaky pipe or a cracked foundation, there are signs of infrastructure issues that are much larger than just the collection itself. Uh, you should be sure to keep an eye out for them uh, when you're in your storage facility. If you find any standing water, make sure you clean it up and dry the area as soon as you can. Look for that water's origin, a leaky pipe or a drain, maybe it's an air duct. And then you should also take preventative measures to limit further condensation. So like adjusting the thermostat or the air conditioning. You may want to run a dehumidifier. Um, and if you can't identify where the standing puddle of water is coming from, it could be that there's a foundational issue of your building where your the floor itself is breaking down and allows the water to seep in. Um, it's important to always be checking for those. And then if you find it, you should at least make sure that your space is on, all the objects in your space are propped up, at least on blocks or something, so they're not on the ground uh, directly. Um, if you find something like a foundational issue with your building, or there's a larger crack or a wall in a wall that's water's getting in through, uh, those can take quite some time to be addressed as an institution, just because of how much it costs to, uh, to solve that issue. The faster you can report them, hopefully gets the ball rolling faster before any more severe damages can occur to your objects. Um, additionally, uh, mold damage as a result from moisture or condensation in your space is not only a dangerous thing for the objects, but also can become very hazardous for the health of your employees and volunteers. Um, we actually have a great Dipsy webinar on mold prevention and response that can be uh, found on YouTube and the Dipsy's webinar page. Once again, I'll link to it at the bottom at the end of this webinar for you guys to check out. Um, when, if you find objects in your collection that are moisture damaged or are still currently wet, uh, if the object itself is, is wet and damaged, you should just consult a conservator and see what happens to see 
what they think and how best to proceed. Um, if just the housing it's in, like maybe a mat is damaged um, or something like that, or maybe the frame is, you should try and just remove the object as a whole from the environment that created the damage. So like the puddle of water, if it's in one. Uh, if it's moldy, you should isolate the artwork. And then once again, if you're lucky and it's not actually, the object itself isn't damaged, you should just try and remat it and reframe it with new materials. And you should store it away from it a uh, contaminated space that was in previously and throw out the old materials that were damaged and moldy. Um, if an object is still wet, uh, you should do your best to isolate it from its housing if possible. Uh, fanning the object will help dry it and prevent mold growth. Uh, once it's dry, um, or if removing, it's from a, removing it from the wet housing is an issue which might potentially damage the object, you should leave it alone and then just bring that object and the housing or just the object after it's been dried to a conserver to see what treatment they deem is necessary or just maybe they can remove the mount that it was that was damaged. Um, sometimes you might have dirty storage conditions. Uh, they're not always in the ideal locations especially if you have a historic building that might be in an attic or a basement um, and places like that can accumulate dust and dirt over the years really quickly. Uh, regularly cleaning them is the best way to combat the issue. And long periods of neglect will have a serious lasting consequence, especially if your objects are housed in older materials or acidic materials or if they're near windows and so forth. Um, housekeeping, which is like cleaning and checking your, your conditions, should be implemented and should go over the entirety of your collection, uh, not just things that are on display. Good housekeeping encompasses a lot more than just vacuuming and dusting. And you can, once again, find a lot of information in the previous Dipney, Dipsney webinar that's available, uh, which will be linked to at the end. Moving on, just to quickly go to the housing-related issues uh, for object-related housing issues. Um, and these are things that are primarily related to damaged objects. Uh, how to, how to identify if it's an object-related issue. Is the object visibly damaged? Is there mold or, or insect detritus on the object? Is there tape on the object? If yes to anything, please do not attempt to fix them. Contact a conservator for a consultation and treatment. Uh, I cannot recommend this enough. How to tell if tape is on an object. Uh, Self-adhesive tapes have been a common form of mending and hinging objects for decades. Unfortunately, the people who used them didn't always know how acidic or damaging the different kinds of tapes could be. Uh, and sometimes that you might see that for tape will be like there's a visible stain of tape that is adhered to the artwork or the Mac board, the backing board, usually is a rectangle. Um, and sometimes if the object, multiple objects have been sep have been taped together and you can't separate them safely because the taper and adhesive is keeping them together. Um, those are the two easiest ways to identify tape. Um, we strongly recommend that you don't try to remove them, uh, uh, remove tape from an object independently because some of the tapes might cause uh, rips and tears as you remove them. Additionally, when you mechanically remove the tape, you will leave behind uh, areas of adhesive residue which might collect undesirable elements like dust, dirt, insects, and so forth. And they can also lead to the objects sticking together. Another issue that depending on where the tape is placed um, and what's under it, as there's a possibility of the tape lifting pigments uh, or other important details as it's removed, which we really don't want. And that means you might lose some of the importance and some of the stuff on your object. Um, all problems that directly involve objects should be handled by conservators who are specifically trained to treat them. Uh, I, once again, I cannot stress this enough. Well-intentioned amateur restorers and, uh, might cause way more damage to an object as they try to help it. Please just leave it to a professional. Next, we have housing and framing issues, um, which can be, oh, which is gonna be a larger part, portion of this webinar. Uh, um, problems that are, problems and solutions that are related to an object's housing conditions. Um, the first thing is, is the object askew in its matter frame? Uh, if it's something and the object has shifted, 
and it's matting or it looks like it's pulling away from the back mat and it's coming in contact with the glazing, then that means that its hinges or its mountings have failed. Um, so when you see that in your collection, some solutions for that are just that you can do yourself are that you should unframe and remount the artwork using a non-adhesive mounting, like the edge strips that uh, I have a photo demonstration of. Um, or if you are uncomfortable doing that, you can contact a preservation framer to remount it with something like mulberry paper hinges and leaf starch paste. Um, it's important to remember Edge strips and photo corners are a great way of mounting an object to the back of the board, especially if you're using like a, a safe PAT, which is a photographic activity test. A photographic activity test. Uh, if it's something that passes that, then the papers are generally safer to use on any kind of object. Um, and then you can secure that to a back mat with something like gummed linen tape, uh, edge strips, photo corners, and various other mechanical means like that can be secured to a back mat without actually putting gum linen tape or any adhesive on top of the object, which is what we always try and avoid. Is there visible yellowing on the mat or the artwork? Um, acidic and poor quality mat board can lead to yellowing and acidification over time. It's especially noticeable on like the bevel of the mat board. And also, you might leave a distinct mat burn or the discoloration in the uh, of the object that's in direct contact with the mat. Uh, it's typically identified by like if you can see in the photograph that I have, you have a, a really strong uh, orangey yellowish like square rectangular uh, burn acidic mark that ends up on the object. Um, some in-house solutions that you can find uh, or do it yourself or just remove it from its mat and store it in like an alkaline folder or a box that's safe. Um, you can also choose, if you choose to, you can remat the artwork using like a 100% rag board, which is the best quality kind of mat board, like a museum board, or a virgin alpha cellulose board, which is an all right mat. And then of course, if you want a professional solution, <clears throat> you can just contact a preservation framer to remat it with museum quality mat board. Um, and if it's too, there is a lot of mat burn, it's a very significant issue on the piece, you can always contact a conservator to see what kind of treatment can be done to, um, to minimize and try and wash that out. <clears throat> wash that out. Sorry, I'm going to have some water again. Um, it is good to note that um, all the mat boards that are made before 1980 will be acidic to some extent. If you're worried or you have concerns about the acidity of the mat board that you use, you can always test it with a pH pen. Just They're really cheap and they're great tools to have if you're not certain as to whether or not your mat boards will cause damage over time. Different kinds of mat board. Uh, there are a large number of them. Uh, museum board, is 100% cotton rag. It's the best board you can possibly use. Many of them, or not many, some of them nowadays have something called zeolites, which help trap and sieve out pollutants from the, the back, the environment that they're in. You also have conservation board, which is made of a 100% virgin alpha cellulose. So it's usually lignin free and it's also good. Um, it's not always the best quality mat board but it's definitely still something that you can use in a collection at a long-term storage or something. And the last one was just acid-free boards, which are kind of like decorative mat boards. It's one of the more commonly just like generic kinds of mat boards that you can find, which are mostly made with buffered wood pulp. Uh, um, unfortunately, they're really not suitable for use in long-term storage co collections just because they are uh, such low quality. Um, things that we usually consider and use for conservation quality mat boards are, once again, cotton rag or refined alpha cellulose. We need to make sure it's lignin-free. Uh, lignin is a naturally non-acidic. Lignin-free boards are naturally non-acidic, so that means that they, you, don't have the, you don't have the risk of them acidifying over time. Uh, the zeolites that I mentioned earlier, uh, they're molecular sieves that 
trap pollutants either from the environment that'll prevent prevent them from going into the paper or the object that you have. Um, and then sometimes, of course, you can have boards that are buffered with calcium carbonate, so they mean like an alkaline pH level, so a little bit higher than seven. Whereas decorative mat boards that you would see that are a bit older or that you can find cheaply are mostly composed of wood pulp and lignin, which are very acidic. Uh, they get buffered to with uh, magnesium carbonate or calcium carbonate to make it alkaline, but that as it will deteriorate over time and will slowly acidify. And then once again, uh, it was the only kind of mat board available was were these wood pulp and lignin decorative mat boards up until about 1980, 1980s. Concerned with checking and make sure that you uh, replace some of your older mats if you can. Um, lastly, decorative mat boards uh, have a very high chance of leaving a mat burn on your object. And going from the front to the back of an object, uh, when you have a housed object, you might have an aesthetic backing board, um, which are unfortunately still very commonly used in the framing industry even today, uh, especially since a lot of them are mark marketed as archival or acid-free. Um, things like foam core might have acid-free paper liners, but the interior foam block isn't acid-free. It's just straight, terrible material. Um, so over time, the acidic components will off-gas or lease into the non-acidic parts, which will cause them to acidify, which will cause your object to acidify, um, which is not good. We don't want that. Uh, if you can identify something like foam core or just brown corrugated board or chipboard or even a wooden backing board, you should really try and replace them with something that is an alkali corrugated board or a rag board or a material that isn't going to leach into your object. Um, so you can find something like an alkaline board or corrugated board, all that jazz that you find, or you can get a con uh, contact a preservation framer and they can replace it for you with something that is never going, uh, that is a non-acidic product. And sometimes they were just, they're historic objects. Uh, sometimes they were not always housed the best way. Uh, sometimes well-intentioned people with no housing experience would have housed objects or they were housed in very precarious ways. Uh, there are countless examples of ways that people used to mat them or try and get them ready for presentation. Uh, I am still always surprised to see some things that walk through the door at the center um, or that I've just seen on display elsewhere at like galleries or uh, things. Um, if you come across something like you see in the photo, you should actually just take it, to a, take it to a conservator, honestly. But if you have something that's housed poorly, some things you can do in-house that are great for it are just to remove it from the matting and you can store it in an outline folder or a box. Um, once again, you can remat it in a better, better mat that's not going to be as damaging. Um, or you can contact a preservation framer to reframe and remat it in museum quality materials uh, and do it properly. Once again, if you have any questions or concerns about it, you should take it to a conservator to see if it needs treatment before you do this. Um, sometimes the object or the mat will look pretty faded. Um, so if there's notable, noticeable fading of an artwork or the mat board, you could be looking at UV light issues. Um, sometimes it's the glazing. Uh, sometimes it's just where it's located in storage. Um, if the if it has a glass glazing and then there's visible bubbles uh, and specks, that means it's probably predates. Oops, sorry. Ooh, go back. It predates UV filtering technology. So sometimes you might need to replace that. Um, some current modern uh, acrylic great glazings are made to be UV filtering, but there are a good number of them that aren't. So. Just in your storage, some good solutions for if you see this happening or notice some objects that look a bit more faded. You could move it around or keep it away from other sources of UV light or general light as a whole. And then if it's something that's framed and has glazing, you should replace whatever glazing that it already has with something that's at least a UV filtering the glazing. Uh, I prefer UV filtering acrylic. 
Um, that's something you can do it on your own. And then you can also just contact a preservation framework to switch out any sort of glazing if it has any or if it doesn't have any uh, to put it to one with a UV filtering acrylic. Um, the photo that you see here are two identical printed broadsides. Uh, the one on the right, the very light one, was actually on top of its stack. And the one next to it was the one directly underneath that, uh, just in the collection. And that's just an example of just how much light fading this, I think it was a, this, the broadside's like not even 10 years old and it's so, it already faded that much. <clears throat> All right. Sometimes you'll find some cracks in your glazing. Uh, cracks in glass especially are dangerous for objects that are stored in frames as glass can shatter and damage or gouge out the art. Um, as I said earlier, acrylic is a much safer option and it's less likely to shatter in a manner that will the surface. Um, another thing to be aware at for glazing is that different kinds of glazings use different kinds of cleaners and cloths. Uh, things like acrylic and glass, the correct cleaner for each one might damage the other. Um, because if you use the incorrect kind of uh, cleaning material or cleaning solution on like a UV acrylic, you run the risk of dissolving the UV coating that is there. Um, or you might also create permanent streaks on the glazing because uh, as it dissolves some of it along the, the path. Another factor that you might run into when you're cleaning your glazing is the different kinds of cloth that you use. Um, generally, microfiber cloths are pretty good. But sometimes when you're doing something like that, you should make sure that you have separate cloths that are impregnated with the different cleaning solutions for each cleaning type. That way you don't accidentally use the wrong cloth for the wrong glazing. Like don't use the glass cloth for acrylic and don't use the acrylic for glass and vice versa. Anyways, back to the cracked glazing issue. If you do find glazing that is uh, cracked, Something that you can do is you just should, the general good practice is to just replace the glazing. Uh, we recommend replacing with a UV filtering acrylic, um, which is something you can do in-house. It's pretty easy to cut. Um, it might be a bit expensive just to get the materials in the first place, but preservation framers um, can also do it. And it's something that we're much more in, likely to already have on hand and have the tools to cut it cleanly and effectively. Um, Okay. Uh, another good point about acrylic is that acrylic is a lot lighter than glass. So you can have much larger sheets of acrylic that can cover larger pieces. Uh, another thing that you might run into with your object is that it might be touching the glazing. Um, so sometimes the substrate will warp or the artwork will kind of fall from one of the tinges. And that's also really dangerous for an object because that means that the media can transfer from the artwork itself to the glazing, which will result in visible media damage. Um, if the object is noticeably damaged, like you can tell, uh, you should contact a conserver directly and see what they recommend doing to consolidate and treat it before you put it back into some sort of housing option. But if the artwork isn't directly on the glass and offsetting, there are some things you can do to prevent it or to kind of help with it on its way. One of those is the in-house things you can do is you can just remove it from its frame and store it flat. Um, that way it's not in a frame, it's not on the glazing, it's safe. Uh, or if you want to keep using it, you should just add spacers between the artwork and the glazing. You can do that in-house. You can like add a strip of like a Matte board, or we use acrylic spacers. It's whatever you want to use. Add a spacer to prevent more, to create a larger depth of your frame, um, so the object won't be touching it. Um, a professional solution you can do though is you can have a con, you can have a preservation framer alter its housing. So you can add spacers. Uh, you can alter the frame depth to have a higher rabbit, so you can put more space in between the object and the glazing, and then you also change the frame itself. Um, also, sometimes what might happen is a preservation framer might look at it and be able to like, oh, your hinges failed. We can re-hinge it or something. 
Um, and if a hinge did fail, that means it's going to be putting harmful stress on a different piece of the object. Um, so you should make sure that you at least get that checked out. Because uh, if it is putting extra stress on another press, another point of the piece, you might run the risk of the object tearing from that stress point. Sometimes. Uh, oh, Carol, what I see your question, I can get to that at the end once it's time for questions. Uh, sometimes you might find a frame um, that's coming apart. Uh, over time, even the most well-made frames will start coming apart, um, which will lead to visible gaps in corners uh, or cracks to form along the bottom edges or any of the edges. Um, another telltale sign of a frame coming apart is that it feels structurally unsound. So like when you are holding it, like it feels like it's wobbly or it's warping or like the thing itself is loose. Um, so you should probably try and remove the object from its frame if it is coming apart. Uh, and you can just store the object flat until you can reframe it in a better frame or get the frame conserved. Um, getting a frame conserved would be a professional solution for it just because it's frame preservation and frame conservation are very, very specialized fields that I really recommend that you don't try at home. Um, you can also, if it's not a, a historically important frame, you can replace it. Um, so one thing that I always say for like replacing frames is you should look at the history of the frame. Is it original? Is it contemporary? Uh, is it something that was made for the object or is it like a mass produced like Ikea frame that you found somewhere? Um, if the frame is unoriginal and it's coming apart and you know it was like just put on randomly at the institution for very little, it might be better a better option to just replace the frame than to get treatment done for it just because it is not as uh, it's not might not be necessary for the object. That's just my opinion on that, though, because that also could be that the it's a contemporary frame that the collector or the institution found that is was like dedicated or kind of in that same time frame, so it gives the correct context to the art that it would have had. Um, either way, it's still going to be a good idea to remove the object from the frame. That way, you can mitigate the risk of the frame falling and the object falling out of it. Sometimes the hanging hardware will look a little bit worn. Um, uh, eye hooks are, there are a large number of really um, ineffective hanging solutions that are out there. Um, things like eye hooks or the Teeth, like the weird teeth hook snappy things. There's, there's a photo of it on the slide. Um, or of course you can have old wire. All those can break and snap. Um, and then hanging hardware failures are very dangerous. So you should be sure to check in on the hanging hardware of your objects every so often, see if they need to be repaired. Um, if you ever find a framed object with an eye hook, uh, we generally recommend replacing them with D-rings. So unscrew the eye hook, put in a D-ring instead. Um, just to minimize the chance of the eye hook falling and failing and ripping itself out. Uh, or sometimes like if an eye hook has an opening, the wire will work its way out sometimes. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've seen things hung with eye hooks and the eye hook itself is really loose or about to come out. Um, and that just means like, if it fails, your object is going to come crash, crashing to the floor, which is really bad. We don't want that. Um, you can also hang works, so if, you, if you can get D-rings onto your object, you can also hang works directly from D-rings, which are even more secure than just like having a the wire hanging from a D-ring. Um, you can also do things like hanging from plates and all that, which uh, you need to make sure you have enough plates to hold all the stress of the object. Anyways, back to the in-house solutions. So if you see small uh, eye hooks or the weird teeth hooks for hanging, which hopefully we don't have in collections. You should just replace it with a D-ring, smaller, medium if possible. Use larger ones and more heavy duty weight ones for larger objects that are heavier if needed. 
Um, you should also try and replace all the wire if it's old, frayed, things like that. Uh, just with things that are plastic coated and braided hanging wire, which have a suitable weight capacity. Um, just because uh, hanging wire that has a high enough weight capacity and weight tolerance is much less likely to fail and snap while something is hung on a wall. Um, of course, you can also contact a preservation framer uh, to just replace the hanging hardware. And that's really most of the general, like, common issues that you will find in, like, a, a framed or in collection storage. Once again, this is more like an overview for it. Um, the next few slides are some resources and materials that we use and recommend just for when you're going about housing and rehousing a collection. Uh, some tools to have around, good quality materials, some vendors you might find stuff from. And then, of course, all the, webina all the webinars that I talked about throughout the presentation. Um, so recommended tools, like I definitely recommend always having needle nose pliers, uh, wire cutters, screwdrivers and screws, exacto knives, micro spatulas to help lift things, a tape measure for accurate measurements, carpet scraps will help uh, hold up frames and like prevent it from scratching your surfaces. Easels are a great way to, when you're unframing something, you can prop it on an easel. That way it's not face down, so it's not uh, falling off of a mat or something. Um, cloth covered weights are really great to help hold stuff down. Um, uh, if you're, if you are framing and unframing things, a framing point driver is great. And as I said earlier, a pH pen to like help check mats. Um, other materials that you might want, ooh, go back, materials, uh, materials, there we go are things like permalife um, or microchamber paper, which are both PAT, so photographic activity test passing papers, um, 10 and 20 point buffered and unbuffered barrier boards, uh, which are like great for using making, making folders and housing things out of. Uh, alkaline corrugated board, also great for making boxes and making housing, um, as well as using as interleaving between frame objects while you have them, they're not on the wall. Uh, and then of course, plastic coated, braided picture hanging wire. It's kind of a material, kind of a tool, but it's something you use for hanging. It's something I very much, we use a lot of. Um, <clears throat> Some places to source materials from. Um, so we get a lot of our stuff at the, at the conservation center from places like Donmar Frame and Molding or Omega Molding. Um, I know they're just, um, they're, they're both places that are uh, suppliers to the Northeast. Um, so if you're looking through that, you can get some stuff from there. If you're looking for like just materials from mat boards and backing boards, Talus has a lot, Gaylord Archival, University Products, all those are places that have a lot of kinds of mat boards or backing boards um, of all kinds you need. Um, for glazing, once again, Omega or Don Moore have them. Um, also, you can get them from places like Everything Plastics. What you want, what you want are things that are like uh, UV acrylic, so some stuff like Optium or TrueView. They're they're their own category of like museum professional quality framing and uh, museum acrylic. So the things that will cut out like I think it's ninety three to ninety nine percent of ultraviolet light. Um, I see your question, Barbara. I'll get to that later once I get the end of this. For hanging hardware, uh, get that really anywhere you need it. Um, I've gotten it from Amazon recently, actually, so it's fairly cheap, although you can get it from other framing supply stores and stuff like that. Uh, paper, interleaving materials, so things like glass, things like uh, mylar, inert polyester film. Get that from Talus or Conservation Resources. Uh, it's, they're, those both also like Talus, Conservation, conservation resources, they have almost everything you need in terms of boards as well. Um, and then if you want some pre-made boxes for uh, holding stuff, you can get that from Hollinger Metal Edge. Uh, Hollinger Metal Edge, there's a G in there actually, I apologize. And then also Talus does custom boxes. And then if you have conservator issues or questions, your local ICA, is your International Conservation Association, or your AIC, your Americans in Conservation, uh, 
chapters will have in that information. Also, you can contact a local museum um, or another mu like a local conservation department within a larger museum, and all the conservators there probably have recommendations for uh, conservators that are in the area that might be able to help you with things. And then some of the Dipsy webinars I was talking about earlier uh, are things that are the collections care basics, housing material basics, introduction to IPM or integrated pest management, um, lighting beyond standards, uh, mold prevention, detection, and response, and then the temperature and relative humidity and collections care webinars. Uh, all, all of these are free Dipsy free Dipsy webinars that are available to anyone really because they're all on YouTube at this point. Um, they're also it at links through the <clears throat> Dipsy's webinar page that you can find later on. Um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, if you have any additional questions or you want resources, you should visit the ccaha.org backslash resources page. And same with Dipsney. Um, you can also reach me at B-I-L-U-Z-A-D-A -A at ccaha.org or give us a call at the center and then ask for Ben. Uh, special thanks to former Dipsney Preservation Specialist Jillian Marcus for all of the fabulous and fantastic previous webinars um, that are they linked to just previously. They're a great source of information for those of you who are looking for things for a bit more specific. And also thank you to paper conservator Chloe Hausman, uh, who I consulted while putting this together. Okay, so now some questions. Uh, we can have time for questions, having people want. If you need anything, I would love to answer what I can. And okay. Back to, so there was Joseph Kennedy, what was that? <clears throat> How can one find and choose a preservation framer? Um, so a lot of conservation listings might have one or have people that are associated with the conservation uh, framing and matting situations already like ready to go. They might have it in-house or they might have uh, resources that you can use to find them. Um, I know here at the Conservation Center in Philadelphia, we have uh, a housing and framing department uh, that's internal to the center. And then we also do conservation framing for things that are not getting treatment or preservation framing for things that are not getting treatment if you need that. Um, and there are a lot of, I believe a lot of the other centers and regional conservation centers have that too. Um, also, you can talk to any of your, if you have a a framer that you highly trust, um, you can see if they do preservation framing, uh, the kind of specificity that you would need for that. Um, some of them do, some of them don't. It's really a, a whole gambit. Um, unfortunately, there isn't really a, I don't know of an actual like resource, resource dedicated just to preservation framers, uh, like of a, like a, a list for that. But I can do some more research and see if I can find one. But usually it's just it's best to just try and find a conservation center that does contract conservation work and then see if they have a framing department. Um, oh, I just didn't note that Marissa set out, but we're sending a recording as well as a, the slideshow uh, PDF with live links and additional resources after this. So you can check it there. Um, uh, Barbara Russell, uh, you have the pastel and you believe that it's, uh, believe the glass is it's up against the glass with the material. Uh, yes, I would recommend getting that checked by a professional conservator, um, just because it is definitely something that I would believe if the, especially when friable, like pastels, it is very easy to transfer media from like, glass or from the paper to glass or paper to acrylic um, and if you just unframe it uh, without paying attention or without too much care you might end up seeing that you're going to come off with a lot of uh, offsetting material um, okay uh, 
any more questions, please type them in the chat. Um, I would love to see anything else or if there's more questions I'd let you know. I don't see anything else at the moment. Um, <clears throat> um, so I, is that Patrice? Are you typing, Rob? Should I? Okay. Well, um, in, I don't know if there are any more questions. I don't know if Patrice is ready to go. No? OK. Um, well, I think that's, if there's no more questions, um, then that'll be it. You're, once again, you're welcome to reach out, give me a call, give me a, shoot me an email, and I'll do my best to get back to you as fast as I can. Um, so I think that is all. I wish you all a very good week, and I will see you guys, hopefully, or hear from you in the future. Thanks for coming, everybody.